Bob, welcome. Thank you. It's great <laughs> to be here. <laughs> I'm very excited uh, to, to be here with you. And you have a special treat out here in the audience, not only to hear Bob uh, talk about today, but also yesterday, uh, his youth. Um, you also have an opportunity to ask some questions. So not at the moment, but um, a little bit further down in the presentation, we're going to invite you to ask some questions in Bob. And I want you to think about it from two perspectives. Uh, one, you have some questions that you might have. But I'd also like to invite you to channel, if you would, maybe some children in your world. Maybe they're your students. Maybe they're your kids or nieces and nephews. What would they want to ask Bob? So that's your work as you listen. Bob, um, before we get into uh, going backwards in time, I would just like to anchor the group in terms of uh, sharing with them some of the things you're most excited about now. What's going on at, at Langer Labs, in your world? What are you excited about? So I run a lab at MIT. Uh, we have about 100 people in it, and I'm a bioengineer, a chemical engineer. And just to give you maybe two examples, one of them is nanotechnology. We're doing a lot of work on creating new kinds of nanoparticles that, uh, like just to pick an example, say somebody has cancer, if you have a, now normally the problem is you give a cancer drug that goes throughout the whole body. One of the things we're trying to do is create nanoparticles just to take the cancer drug and have it go right to the cell you want it to go to. So it would spare the body the rest of it. We're also looking at nanotechnology for new diagnostics that would be much more rapid. You know, sometimes, uh, takes you many days to get a result and that can actually lead to death and so we're working on ways of doing it in seconds or minutes. Another area where we do a lot of work on that I'm excited about is what I guess I'd call tissue engineering or regenerative medicine, something we uh, started many years ago with Jay Vacanti who's head of, uh, of pediatric surgery at Mass General and that's really the idea of combining materials and cells to create new tissues and organs. So today you can make actually new skin for burn victims and but some of the things we're trying to do. Uh, liver on a cell? Liver is an example <laughs> we're working on. Uh, uh, actually, spinal cord repair, vocal cord repair. I mean, almost anything. Uh, you know, and again, it's early other than the skin, but I mean, and we've been working on these things for you know, close to 30 years, but there's been, I think, significant progress made now by a variety of groups around the world, and, uh, and that whole area is another one that you know, we've been very excited about. What in the, in the history of some of the inventions uh, for good that you've created that, boy, I would always want to be, re be remembered for this? Well, maybe, I mean, I, I, there's a, I put them in a couple of pockets, which, you know, so a lot of what we've done is medical. And so we created uh, little microspheres or implants that uh, you can use to deliver drugs for really long times. So now, I mean, just to pick some examples, if somebody had schizophrenia, there's a set of microspheres called Risperdal Consta. It used to be that, like, for example, if those of you that saw the movie A Beautiful Mind with Russell Crowe, he had schizophrenia. He had got shock treatment. But now you can have little microspheres that you can inject and deliver the drug for a long time, and it's had a big effect on hospitalizations and suicides. You don't get shock treatment anymore. Um, similarly, now there's one that just came out for type 2 diabetics that you can inject once in a a week and, and uh, also the drug eluding stents, a lot of that's been based on our work. But we've also done some other things which probably are not in the medical area that some people may know about, like a group of uh, investors, one of whom was my uh, former uh, graduate student, they said, well, can we help in the hair area? Because we've probably invented thousands of things in the really? medical area. Oh yeah, really? no, no, not Tell to give more. you. It's, it's for more for women, oh. but I, it's for guys too. But but it's basically it's, there are places trying to create new hair. I need it too. But this is could we create hair that doesn't have frizz or that has more body or things like that? And so we've invented stuff like that too that can uh, address those problems that are you know reasonably widely used. But and then even things like in swimming pools that uh, and again sometimes it doesn't happen because we intentionally do it. But we've created materials like that, uh, for, you know, like if somebody has a swimming pool, one of the issues is there's a lot of what's called, uh, um, you know, gar sort of like garbagey things in the pool. And yeah. so there's so what are called flocculating agents. And we invented some polymers that one called, that they now call super flock that you put in and it makes them all come together. And, but anyhow, there's lo lo lots, of, lots of things. And then, as I mentioned, some of the engineered tissues like artificial skin and things like that. The, the, uh, the impact is really profound. If you, if you, 
if you were to think about uh, physicians, any of your doctors and patients, at some point, the work that you've done and the work of your team uh, has impacted every one of you and every one of those physicians in some way. Let's anchor with that. Now, I'd like to go back in time, sure, Bob. Sure. So, did you have a, a, a nickname you liked or uh, your friends called you or your well, family? They probably called me, you know, Bobby. I mean, that okay. was, uh, <laughs> so, my mother still calls me that. <laughs> <laughs> so, I want to go back in time. Uh, you know, choose the age, whatever it is, Bobby. Uh, help us go back on that journey. Now, I, I know that maybe there's been some experimentation uh, that you enjoyed at that time. So chemistry sets. Or yeah. Take us back to a time. Really make it real for us. What's going on around you? What are the sights? What are the sounds? When you had an aha, when you were curious, when you discovered something sure. that really tapped into that inspiration to discover in the future. Well, when I, when I was a little boy, you know, I, they don't have these anymore probably because of liability issues, but when I was a little boy, they had what were called these Gilbert chemistry sets and microscope sets. I see people my age nodding. Uh, or, but, you know, so, so those were fantastic. So I remember like almost every year I'd get a, I'd, my parents gave me, you know, eight, nine, ten, different one for my birthday. You know, one for, uh, one was an erector set, one was a microscope set. So just to pick that, you know, they had this thing with shrimp eggs and you'd put the, I mean, there were experiments that would, highly likely work because you know we're little kids but you know you put the shrimp eggs in and you actually can watch the shrimp hatch it's, it was pretty amazing chemistry things I mean I, I remember getting that and you know we had this sort of dumpy cellar and I put all these chemicals down there and to me I've always liked magic and one of the things that you know I mentioned that before you know that's very cool to me is like you could have two different colors uh, solutions and you would pour them together and they would come to a third color and it was a chemical reaction but I, I, I was always fascinated by those kinds of things. And, and those were all like, you know, just kind of eureka things. I mean, I, I didn't know exactly what would happen. I mean, sometimes you could read a little bit about it, but th those Gilbert sets were wonderful. Not knowing what was going to happen. So you talked about before some of um, your interests outside. Was magic something that you picked up as a, as a young child? Or yeah, is that I, older? Well, I, I, well, I guess throughout life, you know, I've always liked magic. I mean, uh, you know, I guess when I was little, I would watch it, and I was fascinated by it. And then as I got a little older, not that much older, I, you know, I'd try to see how some of the magic tricks were done. So I, you know, when I got old, I remember actually, um, you know, there actually used to be even these magic stores in Boston. Um, i trying to remember the name of it. Hank Lee's, I think, Magic Shop, and it was great. You'd go there, and they would do tricks for you, and you could buy them. They, 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 I think they moved out of town, but you know, if you go to New York City, they have those kind of things. And you know, I could stay there for hours and you know watch them and buy tricks and and do them. And you know, I did them for my kids, and you know, did other shows. But I, but it was a lot of fun. So, if you can if you can think about maybe one discovery, you know, uh, an experiment that you tried or a discovery that you had when you were when you were a kid. Can you describe that for us? Well, I think, I don't know if I really made a discovery. I mean, I, I could tell you about things that that I tried to do that didn't work. You know, most things that we tried to do, like with the chemistry and microscope set, I mean, they were, they were sort of, I, and I think that's good, they were probably the chances where they would work because they wanted kids to have some confidence. You know, I mean, most times, I mean, that's one of the things about research. If anybody that does research probably knows you'll have thousands of failures for one success. I don't know, know that you want to have a little kid see that. You know, it's, it's, uh, you know it might be discouraging. I, I, so I would be, so I'll, I'll give you both sides of it. On the positive side, you know, I, just what I mentioned, I, you know, we, I could mix two colors together. And um, I mean, a simple thing is like if you put uh, something called phenolphthalein in water, you know, and depending on, it, that, depending on whether something's acid or base, it'll turn pink, you know, and uh, so that's an easy way to, you know, change color. Uh, you could make rubber. I mean, there's a, something called a nylon rope trick where you have two um, solutions and you put something in each of them and nylon will form at the interface and you can just pull it out. And, uh, and you know, so, so they're, th th but those are sort of, what should I say, easy, I'll give one more easy one if anybody wants to do it and as a chemical hood. You can take sugar and put it in a beaker 
and if you put sulfuric acid in, nobody should do this if they don't know chemistry. <laughs> but <laughs> but it's, it's actually very cool. You put, you put sugar in the beaker, not that much. You put the sulfuric acid in, and slowly it starts to turn black, and then it starts to rise up out of the beaker. And, and uh, you know, could come all the way out, depending on what you do. But those are all, but let's just tell you one which I thought I'd do and it didn't work. Um, you know, like I thought, well, I was reading something about making gunpowder. And, and, oh. and, and I had two of the three things, actually carbon and I think it was sulfur, in my chemistry set. So I felt all I needed was the third one, which I think was potassium nitrate. It's a long time ago, my memory could be off. So I remember, you know, there, but there were these hobby shops you could go to, and I was able to get, I'm not sure why they, let me have it, <laughs> but uh, potassium nitrate. Well, actually, a side story in that is I remember much later I was at one of these stores to get something else, and this little kid came in and wanted to buy potassium nitrate. <laughs> and the, the guy kept saying, well, why do you want it? And the little kid would never tell him. And I thought, and, and, you know, they were going back and forth for about five minutes, and I figured I knew why he wanted it. But, uh, <laughs> but, but at any rate, I, I, so me and my friends, you know, we'd put the three together, and we'd light it. We'd, put it behind the tree, we'd light a match, and we'd run away because we thought it would blow up, and it never blew up. So that was discouraging. Later on, I found out, I guess, it had to be under a certain amount of compression or something to, to do all this. But you just don't know. I mean, a lot of times when you do experiments, you don't know. Um, and it's, e like I say, it's tremendously easy to fail. All those inventions that we talked about earlier, I mean, you know, they took years to develop. I mean, and failure after failure after failure. In fact, if somebody does research, what you have to be really good at is dealing with failure, because you're going to fail an awful lot more than you'll succeed. Um, so, you know, I've gotten to be pretty good at <laughs> dealing with <Yeah>. failure. <laughs> so. It's part of the experimenter's uh, code. Yeah. Well, it is, and and it's also, you know, it, it, research is a long-range thing. You know, as a teacher, you get <laughs> rewards when you teach somebody on a given day. You can make somebody happier, let's say, or see that they're learning. Research, and I've gotten a lot of satisfaction of seeing my students do good research, but it takes, you know, a thesis, a good thesis takes three or four years. Yeah. You, you've bridged, Bob, over into teaching, and uh, at, at Langer Labs, uh, looking at some of the videos of folks that have gone through your programs, and they speak of you as a great mentor. Um, and I'm no doubt that you, that you are that. Go back to your childhood, and can you think of that, that Maybe it was a teacher, maybe it was someone outside of the teaching world that was a mentor or an inspiration for you that kind of put that mentor DNA in, in you. Well, I think, um, I think there are a couple people. I mean, when I was really young, my dad was a great mentor. I mean, he uh, you know, played a lot of math games with me and stuff like that. When I was older, really, the person I think that made me a good mentor when I w was actually when I was after my graduate work, I did postdoctoral work with a man named J Judah Folkman, who was a surgeon at Boston Children's Hospital, and he was a wonderful mentor. Partly because he had big ideas, and and partly because he thought anything was possible. And sometimes it's just great to see that as an example. And so I felt he, you know, that was for me, a, a, you know, a great thing to see. And he certainly got a lot of criticism. You know, a lot of, that's the other thing that people may not always, always realize about science. If you do things that sort of go against uh, conventional wisdom, in other words, which is often going to be the case if you do something important or get some patents, um, a lot of people will criticize you, um, you know, at, at different levels. And, um, you know, and you have to also learn how to deal with that. It's not always pleasant. And, uh, you know, I got to see that about him and how he deal with it. And, I mean, that was probably a helpful example for me to see, too. Resiliency. So, yeah, yeah, resiliency, yeah. 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 Maybe even more than that. It's just, uh, but resiliency is a part of it. It's, it's also just, uh, you know, just difficult that, that when you go around and when people criticize stuff like that. I want to go to the audience, sure. and then we'll come back for some closing okay. comments. Now, are you... I'm an educator. Yes, Diane, are you you or are you channeling a uh, student or child in your I'm life? asking this question to, from, from yourself. myself. Okay, great. You've just hit on something I think that's really critical. Um, I'm an educator of educators. Mm -hmm. Educators that do things outside of the conventional wisdom are criticized sure. a great deal, and it's very hard right. um, for them. So given your experience doing what you've done, um, and also being an educator, what 
advice or thoughts would you have for those who are attempting, and among the most conservative of systems we have, to attempt to do the unconventional um, within the frame of, of education? Yeah. Well, I, I think it's a great question, and, and my answer may not be that terrific. My advice would be, if you really believe in it, don't stop, you know, don't listen. And, and in the end, I mean, it may take many, many years. You know, it's interesting. I mean, today, I mean, if I just even look at my career just as a scientist, I mean, I probably had about 15 or 16 years being a chemical engineer where all the chemical, maybe more, where all the chemical engineers thought I was nuts and stuff like that. But, you know, if you hang in there, and I, I did, you know, now I've, I mean, you know, gotten different awards and stuff like that, and I think the world recognizes that it's important. But it took, I mean, you know, it, it took many, many years. I mean, and, and, I, and I would just say it's worth it, you know, in the end, if you really believe in it, no matter how criticized you are, no matter how bad it is, that's the only way the world changes, you know, and, and I think at the end, you know, it, it's, it's not like it's going to be pleasant, but I, I would still, if somebody really believes it, I'd hang in there. I'm from the very exotic South Dakota, um, where innovation is not always valued probably as much as it would be in some areas like this. And so you touched on a couple of things regarding confidence and uh, creative confidence or innovation confidence. I'm, I'm curious how you, how you balance that. You know, someone as you're such a distinguished such as yourself would, is probably afforded more leeway than, than young kids or, or young researchers might be. How do you maintain that creative confidence and, and that, um, that sense of, of innovation and adventure um, in areas where, um, you know, geographically or economically, a, a student might not necessarily have that? Yeah, well, it's a very good question. I, and I'm not sure that I have any great wisdom on that, but my feeling is, is that, you know, some of it's going to be the environment that's set up. In other words, if it's an encouraging environment and there are good mentors there that say, look, it's good to, it's good to innovate, you know, obviously the very fact that you're here, I mean, you probably are such a mentor. You know, so if students see that and if it's valued, you know, I think that, that those kinds of things are good, you know, and, and, and I think it can be done by positive reinforcement, you know, that, that when you see students come up with ideas, you know, I'd do that with my kids. Sometimes, I mean, their ideas weren't even that great, but I would tell them this is really good and it's really good that you're thinking about this stuff, you know? And, and I think that there's, and that, that really, you know, would, would encourage them a lot. Like, I would do that with my daughter and I think that may, and now she, you know, she comes up with all kinds of ideas. So I, I think that, so, so, so much of it, I think, is by older people, you know, being role models, and, but really using, like I say, positive reinforcement. You want to be honest. But you, but, but you can still say, boy, that's just really good and, you know, and, and, and make sure that they would use the, you know, you'd use the glasses half full rule that they could see that, boy, there's an awful lot of good in that idea. And then they'll keep coming back, I think, for more. Maria. Hi, very nice to uh, listen to you. And when you said conventional wisdom, that was just great. <laughs> it tapped something I was, have been thinking about, this sure. gap about what's common sense, but it's not good. <laughs> right. The other thing I was thinking of, uh, to be creative, productive, that goes together and in the academy where I'm working. And I was thinking about being a team leader. Uh, what do a good team leader do? Well, I think it depends on what the team's doing exactly. But, but I think some of it goes to what I said before. In other words, I think you want to get people to be thinking big, to be thinking you know, about ideas that are really important. And I think you want to encourage them, you know, in an honest way and, and, and get them to work together in, 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 a, in a good, productive way, you know. And, and I think it's, it's those kinds of skills that I think would have, you know, be good for, you know, I just think about what I do in a lab, which is probably not quite the same, but I think, you know, you try to come up with some ideas, you encourage people, you spend time with them, particularly when they run into problems. And, uh, but you're always encouraging them to think about the next great thing and to, you know, and to finish what they started. What do you need educators to do to bring to you the students that will be the best in your lab? So when students come out of high school, what are they not doing and what are they doing that helps you um, create a, a better team of people who are making things happen? As I think probably educators do a good job overall, though I think science education can probably be stronger. You know, I, I think that that if people have the right kind of background, I mean, 
that, that, that they can do good. But I'll say a couple of things, sort of in general. One, you know, the United States, I think there was a report by the federal government called a number of years ago called Rising Above the Gathering Storm, pointing about how science education, in particular in the United States, was you know, one of the poorest compared to most countries. And one of the things they pointed out was probably 20% of the people who teach science in the United States actually have any background in science. And, and, and I think that, uh, you know, and, and, then, and then there's some purely societal things that have nothing to do with education that, um, but that have a lot to do with the United States culture and, and laws. So another thing that came out in that, that report, which I thought was staggering to me doing research, is that you know there's more money spent on tort litigation than on all research and development in the United States. You couldn't find that in any country in the world. You know, I mean, that's just staggering when you look at the amount of money spent not, or not spent on things like you know, education and research. I mean, because so much is spent on legal things. Uh, so I think that there are cultural issues that, uh, you know, what, what really is important to me is to put more money into you know, training great educators and having education. I suppose the third thing I'd say, which is a cultural thing, and this is also, I think, maybe true more in the United States than some other countries, is people often say you, you get, society gets what it rewards. So our society rewards, you know, baseball and football and actors and actresses far, far more than, uh, you know, most countries. And so little kids often think, well, that's what I want to be. They don't necessarily think that they want to be, a, a, you know, a writer or a, or, or, or a scientist or an engineer, you know. And so I think, and I think those things, uh, so I, I think a lot of these things are just societal things. But I think the educators, you know, I mean, I've seen an awful lot of great educators, but they're, but in the United States, sometimes they're fighting an uphill battle because of the things that I just mentioned and others. Um, What's your name? Hi, my name is Helen Charov. I'm with an organization in Connecticut called the Connecticut Invention Convention that works with 10,000 young inventors every year in grades K through 8. And in fact, this woman here who's on my board works with 500 of them every year in her school. The question that I have for you <coughs> is that typically in engineering school, uh, when you get in there, they say, look to the left, look to the right. Neither one of those people are going to be there with you when you're graduating because of the natural or maybe unnatural attrition. Do you think it's worthwhile in terms of engineering or STEM education in general to attempt to include more of those lefters and writers to create a greater pool of STEM professionals? Or do you think that at least here in the United States, we're kind of on target in terms of being able to skim the best of the best. No, I, I, I would, I don't know that we know the best of the best. I would take your first point. I think it'd be better to, I, you know, I think it's better to encourage people. And I also think probably another issue with education, particularly a lot of these science and edu engineering education is to make the courses that people take both in high school and in early college years, you know, more relevant and more interesting, and uh, uh, you know, and, and 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 get people excited about them. I think that we can probably do a much better job. One more question back here, and I'd also like to invite if there's a child somewhere in you that has a question that you could channel. So you're my hero. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You're a guy that I look up to. 28 companies coming out of MIT. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you should be on the duck boat today going down, <laughs> going down the street. But, well, but, okay. the, but the sad part is I'm a freak for that. <laughs> and I, my point is, how can we get you to be more of a hero to kids? Like the Edison of, I mean, you're, you're a modern day Edison as far as I'm yeah. concerned. Well, well th th thank you. I, and I don't think, it's hardly just me. I mean, I think, it, you know, really it's public relations, it's pr the press, and, you know, and, and it goes back to the type of thing that, you know, for, and, and I would say that's probably true for everybody here. I'd like to see educators, you know, uh, out of two. And I think, uh, you know, so I, I, I think it really is, like, like I say, a lot of what media, I think, really can, uh, ha has a lot to do with, doing what you said. So I think it's really through the media probably is the one way that probably can help 
those kinds of things happen. We should make a Disney character. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, it's funny. You go to other countries, so they actually did that. You know, like I was just came back from Korea, and they actually had a very nice thing where they had a number of people like myself lecture to about uh, you know 10,000 kids in my high school. So the, they actually have outside the, the Korea University, they had. Uh, pictures of everybody with me. I, they had me looking like Iron Man. <laughs> I actually didn't make it. But, but it's, it's actually amazing. They did that for a number of the people. But see there, like in Asia, they put a much different priority on scientists than they do in the United States. I wish we had more time um, to entertain more questions, but I want to thank you, Bob, for your time My here pleasure. with us. Thank and, you. And for